Matthew chapter 27, as we continue on this journey with Jesus, we're coming to the end now of this gospel record, and what a study it's been. And we continue here with the King's Trials. Uh, that was our title last week, King's Trials, uh, because it, there was more than one. There was this all-night trial with the Jewish leaders, and now he's going to be taken uh, to the Roman authority Pilate here. Matthew chapter 27 if you begin reading with me in verse 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel, what a bad position to be in, against Jesus to put him to death. Boy, I tell you this morning, you don't want to be on that side. You don't want to be against Jesus. You want to be, the Bible says we were at enmity with him because of our sin. And while we were at enmity, while we were enemies and sinners, the Bible says, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, he wants to save you. So this day, this is crucifixion day, if you will, uh, begins in Matthew 27, verse 1, and the morning was come. Uh, let me, by the way, give you just a little bit of the order of the narrative of the day, crucifixion day. Tonight I'm going to give you some of what happened on the cross, the order of events and his seven sayings and things like that. But let me just give you this, if you'd like to write some of this down, or at least maybe make note of some of it. Uh, I know you have to compare all the gospel records to get the whole order. And, uh, and so I'm not, we're not studying all of the different gospel records this morning, just going to stay to Matthew. But let me give them to you. Uh, first of all, early in the morning, Jesus is brought before Caiaphas in the Sanhedrin. And he is condemned and mocked. Uh, Matthew 26, uh, we read that, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. Uh, the Sanhedrin lead, number two, the Sanhedrin lead Jesus to Pilate. We see that here in Matthew 27, uh, and then also Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 18. Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. You see that in Luke 23 and John 19. Matthew totally uh, leaves that off. Uh, number four, Jesus is again brought before Pilate, who releases Barabbas and delivers Jesus to be crucified, Matthew 27. And Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 18 and 19. Uh, then Jesus is crowned with thorns and mocked. Matthew 27, we see that. Mark 15, John 19. Then the suicide of Judas, Matthew 27. And then number seven, you're led, he's led forth to be crucified. The cross is then laid upon Simon the Cyrene. And Jesus discourses to the women is on the way there to Golgotha, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. And so we'll share about the order of the events of the actual crucifixion, but that's for crucifixion day, kind of how that falls. And you can study that out for yourself uh, as you compare the gospel records. Let's keep reading verse 2. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I've sinned and that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful for to put them in the treasury because it's the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. When you see something like that, unto this day in the scriptures, it means to this writing. All right. If you went to Israel today, you may not find it called that, right? But at this time, as Matthew writes this. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued whom they of the children of Israel did value. And they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. It's hard to argue with silence, isn't it? Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him, to never a word. In, as mu in so much that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. 
And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? Pilate knew he was innocent. But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult or a, uh, about to start a riot type of an idea was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And Mark, it says, a purple robe. And really, if you think of an old uh, tunic or cloak of the Roman soldier, probably a good way to describe it, faded or reddish purple. It's not a contradiction, but two men. There are two descriptions, reddish purple. I call something blue, someone says green. Yeah, probably a good description. Verse 29. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit upon him. They took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to be to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, which him they compelled to bear his cross. When they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him. And parted his garments, casting lots that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. Upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. We'll bring the message this morning entitled, The King's Blood. You notice the first 25 verses, blood is said again and again. You see it in verse 4, I betrayed the innocent blood. We sing about the blood because Jesus said, take this cup, which is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Of course, here in verse number 8, the field of blood is mentioned. In verse 6, the price of blood. Uh, verse uh, number uh, 24, uh, he washed his hands, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. In verse 25, his blood be on us and our, ch our children. The king's blood. Let's pray together. Lord, would you help us now as we look at your word? Lord, we know we tread on holy ground here. Father... We do not comprehend why you love us like you do. We praise you for your love. We're amazed by your love. But that you would give your only begotten Son for, as the hymn writer said, a worm such as I. As wretched sinners hell deserving that you gave the most priceless gift, you gave yourself. We stand in awe. We're amazed. And I pray, Lord, as we hear and see what you say in your word, we would see it should have been me. That was my beating. It was for love that he took all this. And Lord, that we might serve you with more vigor, and with all our might, as a result of this wonderful love fest here in Matthew 27, for me and for these people here, and for the whole world. And that we might share of this wonderful message of love, that you died for all men, Tasted death for every man, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Father, I pray that you'd stir our hearts again. If there's one lost here, save them, we pray today. In Jesus' name we ask. 
Amen. Verse 1, we begin again when the morning was come, this, this Jew, Jewish council that met illegally overnight at Caiaphas' house reconvenes in the morning with washed face, maybe change of clothes, uh, so they uh, can de- deliver the official verdict uh, so as to not to appear like they did something illegal. But they did. The whole trial at night, and then the way they abused him in verse 67 of 26, after the verdict, then they began to buffet him and spit upon him. That wasn't the Romans, that was the Jewish leaders, the supposed to have been God's people, and their religious leaders began to mistreat and abuse uh, the Lord Jesus. And so here, here they are. I want to see number one this morning, three things. Number one, the king's condemnation. The king's condemnation, you notice in verse number three, the Bible says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was, what is it? Condemned. Condemned. See, Judas evidently comes in here as Jesus is maybe being taken out. Verse 2 says, uh, when they bound him, they led him away. And so uh, maybe they pass in the hall. Maybe he sees just the, the backside of the, of, of the, the guard that's, that's, that's ushering Jesus to Pilate, uh, to the governor, and, and Judas is coming in. But he sees he's condemned. Uh, it almost seems like uh, that, that uh, as you read this passage, that Judas assumed Jesus was going to get out of this. Remember, he had seen at least on two occasions they come to kill Jesus. One time they tried to cast him off a hill, remember, and to fall into his death, and he just passed right through the crowd. Because his hour was not yet come. Uh, The Lord was in control, wasn't he? Other times they picked up stones, wanted to stone him, but they could not, because it must be fulfilled according to the Scriptures the way he would die. And so uh, perhaps it would seem that Judas maybe thought, look, I'm done with Jesus. I realize he's not going to set up a kingdom. I'm not going to get a good place in the new kingdom here that we thought of a militant Messiah would have. So I'm going to make myself 30 pieces of silver. I'm going to do my part. I'll turn him over. Then he'll slip away unscathed like he's done before. I'll be 30 pieces of silver richer. Jesus will be fine. He can get out of it. But he sees here that Jesus is condemned. Verse 4, he repented himself, you read in verse 3, and brought again 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Verse 4 saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. What truth? He was right. And they said, oh, what a group. What is that to us? Like, what do we care about that? That's your business. See thou to that. Think of it. Innocent, guilty, makes no difference to us. All we want is him dead. We don't care if he's guilty. We don't care if you think he's innocent. We just want him dead. Remember verse 18 told us, Pilate said he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Not because he had done anything wrong, not because he was worthy of death. Of course, it was just because they wanted him dead for their sake, for their political means. Again, we see the blindness and pride of a religious group who are illegally and illegitimately killing an innocent man and here the Lord of glory. And yet, read verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver piece and said, it's not lawful for them to put them in the treasury because it's the price of blood. Yeah, isn't it amazing even sometimes in churches that people that couldn't care less about people dying and going to hell Boy, start talking about money and hold on, what are we doing with the money here? What's going on with the money, you know? They don't care that Jesus is dying. Innocent. But, whoa, we better really make sure what we do with this money now. This is really important. But let's not spend any money on something that we don't think is okay. Let's not, let's not put it in the wrong place. Isn't that amazing? What blindness, what coldness... What pride of a religious group here. Having their scruples over where the money is going to be put, that's the price of blood. Uh Oh, be careful, it's unlawful to put in the treasury. Now you care about the law? Here's an innocent man. Here's one that you brought, the Bible said three times, the end of Matthew 26. False witnesses, false witnesses, false witnesses. 
Even the high priest rent the high priestly garment, which was illegal to do according to the law. But now you're worried about the law? See, the leaders are careful to observe the law even while they're guilty of breaking it. While committing the most lawless act in history, those priests discuss the niceties of, of the law and, and conscience regarding this blood-tainted money. Again, you see the coldness and blindness of people. And by the way, I'm guilty. We're guilty. How often we can see someone else's sin, and I can't believe that person, what they do, and how they... But our own sin, we gloss over, and it's no big deal. That's like the guy that Jesus said has a beam in his eye, and he's worried about some little splinter, a little moat in somebody else's eye. Here they've got a beam in their eye of, of killing the innocent Lord of glory, and they're worried about, oh, wait, 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 wait where we put those coins? Hold on. This shows the coldness of their heart, the blindness of men's heart. Verse 5, the Bible says that he cast down the pieces of silk, Silver. Verse 3, it actually said that Judas repented himself. Notice that. This repented here, just to be clear, is not a repentance unto salvation or a repentance uh, of sin in the way we would think. It's a one of remorse and regret at the consequence. He did not want Jesus to actually die. When he saw he was condemned, he thought, oh no, I was just hoping to make a little money off it. So he, he's, his regret, not, not a sorrow for sin that leads to a change of mind and action, not repent like we would talk about. I was headed my way. All we like sheep are gone astray and turned everyone to our own way and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh, the Bible says, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. It's not talking about repenting in that sense where we turn from our way and turn to Christ. Uh, repent literally means to turn. Someone said that all men are born with their backs to God, and salvation turns them right towards God, turns them around. And so it's not that type of repentance. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, we can see the result here. This is a repentance or a regret of being caught or a remorse that led to despair, but not real repentance. We see in Peter true repentance. And notice verse 75, And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou should not deny me thrice. Uh, verse 75, right before chapter 27, and he went out and wept bitterly. You see, Peter truly repented, and we saw last week how Jesus restored him after, but Judas did not repent, and this led to suicide. The Bible says in verse 4 there, uh, they said, what is that to us? And he cast down the piece of silver, verse 5, in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. I don't know where you're at this morning in your life, what things you've done, what's going on in your relationship between you and the Lord, or maybe there isn't one. But I want to tell you, even in this case with Judas, if he would have turned to Jesus, there was mercy yet. If you would turn to Jesus, there's forgiveness yet. doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how bad you've broken God's word. Doesn't matter how far you've gone. Whether you're saved and you're backslidden or you've never been saved and you're away from God, if you'll come to Jesus, there's help. There's repentance. But you keep following the devil, you keep going the world's way, and guess what? He'll help you commit suicide. He wants to kill you. You ever want to see what, God, what the devil would like to do to every person? Look at Job's life. He killed his ten kids as quick as he could. He would have taken Job's life, but God wouldn't let him. The devil wants to kill and destroy. That's what he's seeking. The Bible says, be sober, vigilant for your adversary the, as a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to take everyone to hell he can. If you're saved, he'd like to kill you just as much because he hates Jesus and doesn't want you to be an influence and a witness to anyone else. That's our enemy. And so here he is and kills himself. Jesus is on his way to the cross to die for the sins of the world, even for Judas, even his sins. If he would only turn to the Lord. I'm telling you, friend, Jesus paid for your sins on Calvary. It's already done. You don't have to serve so many years in this church. You don't have to crawl on your knees to this altar. Uh, it's nothing you could do to earn your salvation or, or the remission of your sins. It's already been done. We sing the song, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Uh, it's all over. It's paid for. The matter is, would you receive this gift that Jesus extends? The wage of sin is death, and that's what you deserve. Hell, forever, that's what I deserve. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of Calvary, because of what he did, that's what he's extending and offering. And like any gift, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to do so many things to get it. It's a gift. You just receive it. Just receive it. And Jesus says in John 1, I came into my own, my own received me not, but as many, John 1, 12, as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And Jesus wants to save you just like that. He'd do it today if you'll come and receive Christ today. Even in the 11th hour, Judas could have turned to the Lord, been forgiven. But in Judas, we see an example of the terror of a lost soul. It's interesting if you ever read last words of people, read the last words of atheists like Voltaire or others, and they talk about, bring another light in the room. I, I just am being closed by darkness as they die. Versus someone like Moody. That began, he took a long time dying. He started seeing his grandkids and different things, quite something as he was dying. And then finally just declared, this is my coronation day. And he died. D.O. Moody, who lived for God. It's totally different death for someone that doesn't know Christ, for someone that does. I'll tell you, the terror of a lost soul we see in Judas, the spiritual blindness that sin causes, the delusion that sin brings, really the sin is in, brings insanity. There's an insanity in sin. You see people drunken in what they've done to themselves. You see people drugged in what they've done to themselves. And like a Bible says, the dog returned to vomit. When, I, when shall I awake? I'll seek it yet again. Why would you seek it yet again? You read Proverbs there. You've been stricken. You have wounds. You don't know why. You've uttered perverse things, but you're beaten up. As soon as you wake up, you can't wait to get it again. Truth is, all of us know someone like that. But your sin's the same way and mine is too. There's an insanity in sin. Sin brings death. Sin brings regret. Sin brings hurt to you and to others. Yet how often we allow sin go unchecked in our life. And don't let the devil lie to you. Your sin affects more than just you. May God help us. Here Judas hangs himself as a result of not turning to God and the spiritual blindness that comes from that. Verse 9 they talk about what to do with the money to buy this field of blood to bury people that don't have a place to be buried. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying they took the 30 pieces of silver. The price, oh, this phrase to think about, the price of him that was valued. You know what the price was? It was the price of a slave. That's what 30 pieces of silver bought, a slave. But think of the value of Jesus, whom they of the children of Israel did value. Oh, immeasurable value. I mean, what price could you put on the Son of God? Can I ask you this morning, how much does Jesus mean to you? What's His value to you in your life? Maybe I should ask it this way. Would it be obvious that He's highly valued if I looked at your calendar, your schedule? How you use your time. Or if we looked at your bank account or mine, would it show up that he's highly valued to you? Or would it be sports or clothes or camping world or what 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 where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, the Bible says. The price of him that was valued. How much do you value Jesus Christ? By the way, this prophecy of the potter's field is alluded to in Jeremiah 18. You can read it for yourself. Uh, and first spoken by Jeremiah, but it, it was first written really exactly like this in Zechariah. If you want to see the prophecy, it's Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. It's almost like there was one author to all the books of the Bible, you know, the Holy Spirit of God. But uh, certainly he, again, is fulfilling. Matthew's careful to point that out over and over, even what we read over and over about fulfilling prophecy, fulfilling all the prophecies. Verse 11, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, Thou sayest. Almost like, it's as you've said. And really, John, if you turn to John, chapter 18, John shares the most of this interview uh, with with uh, Pilate. And we're not going to turn to all the other places. It's the only other place we'll turn, actually. But I want you to look at John 18. Would you turn there with me? It's interesting to contrast as you do read the whole of the narrative of what happened on Crucifixion Day 
It's interesting to contrast his interview with Herod versus his interview with Pilate. Jesus never said one word to Herod, not one. But he spoke quite a bit to Pilate. We're going to read it in just a minute. And I believe the reason he didn't speak to Herod is because Herod had scorned and rejected the Word of God in his life. John the Baptist preached and said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And so he imprisoned him for it. Then he cut his head off for it. And so he had silenced the voice of God in your life. By the way, be careful how you grieve the Spirit of God, and eventually you can quench the Holy Spirit of God in your life if you say no, no, no to His Word. See, the most fearful thing this morning to happen is not that God speaks to you and you say no and walk out. The most fearful thing is that God doesn't speak to you anymore. You hear a message, you hear preaching, you, the, you read the Bible at home or wherever, and God doesn't speak to you. The Holy Spirit of God doesn't stir your heart about your own sin or about uh, things you ought to do or even just warm your heart about the amazing love of Jesus and what He's done for you, and it has no effect on you. That's the most scary place to be in. Herod had said no and rejected God's Word. I believe that's why Jesus did not speak to him. You know how many people got saved on crucifixion day? A bunch. We'll look at more tonight. The thief got saved. I don't know how many Roman soldiers got saved. The centurion and others that says they. We'll look at that tonight. Uh, the guy that carried his cross gets saved and his boys get saved. We'll look at that in just a minute. Pilate, Jesus was witnessing to, I believe, to, want, to win his lost soul. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. But Herod gets not one word from him. Again, I believe it's because he had said no to God. Quite interesting. Jesus is silent before Herod, I believe, because Herod had silenced the voice of God in his life. But Pilate is given the opportunity to hear the truth. In fact, Jesus brings up the truth. And Pilate even asks quite a question, what is truth? Look at it, John 18, verse 28. Then they led, then led they, Jesus, from Caiaphas under the hall of judgment. It was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So you can imagine, they're in, Pilate's in the judgment hall. Jesus is taken into him as a prisoner, but they would stay out. And you're going to see as we read, they're going to bring Jesus out and pull Jesus back. Bring Jesus out, pull Jesus back. Pilate himself is going to come out to them and reason with them, then go back in and talk to Jesus more, because they would not come in because they wanted to eat Passover and did not want to become unclean as far as their Jewish law. Verse 29. Uh, Pilate, uh, lest they should be defiled, but they that might eat the Passover. Verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation are you bringing against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. And then said Pilate unto them, Take him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to him, It's not lawful for us to put any man to death. See, they didn't want to just judge him in some way. They want him dead. That was it. And they couldn't do it, so that's why they're at Rome. Or bringing him to Roman authority. Verse 32. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. That's referring to the prophecy. We'll come back to that. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? So that was one of their accusations. They knew they didn't care. The Romans didn't care about blasphemy. I don't care if he said he was God or God's son. It didn't mean anything to me. They didn't care about blasphemy. But you start talking about another king, they were interested in that because they didn't want an uprising. Israel had already been a problem for them. The Jews already a rebellious people uh, to the Roman occupation. And so you start talking about some other king, that's a problem. So that's the one that accusation that they were, they brought many accusations. We read that in Matthew and he said, you're not saying anything about all these accusations. But Rome didn't care about most of those accusations. But this accusation, a king, that was their concern. Verse 34, Jesus answered him, sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? See, Jesus is in effect saying, but whom say ye that I am? Remember he said to the disciples, what, 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 what do they say I, the Son of Man, am? And they say, well, some say you're a prophet, some say you're Jeremiah, some say John the Baptist. But then he comes to the question of all questions, the question for you today. If you don't know Christ as Savior, who do you say that I am? It doesn't matter if your husband's saved, your wife's saved, or your kids are saved, your parents saved. Are you? What have you said? Who do you say Jesus is? That's what he's asking him. Did someone tell you that? Or are you saying this? Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation, the chief priest, had delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. 
that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore saith and said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, or in verse 37, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth <laughs> heareth my voice. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. No man comes to the Father but by me. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What a question. What is truth? He was talking to the truth, wasn't he? The Bible says, Thy word is truth. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Think of that. Nothing. He's done nothing amiss. And that's true of our Savior, isn't it? Verse 39, But ye have a custom that I should release unto you at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. 19 verse 1, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a corn, crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, remember scarlet in the other passage, it was just reddish purple, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. And Pilate therefore, we'll come back to that, smote him with their hands. Uh, it's called hot hands they played. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. So inside they're abusing him. The soldiers have scourged him. They put the crown of thorns on his head now. And he brings him out before them. I'll mention why I think in a minute. Verse 6, When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said unto him, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? See, I think as he talked with him, he recognized this isn't a normal man. You, you get around Jesus, you recognize there's something different about this man. We sing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. The Jews Answered him, we have a law. Jesus gave him no answer when he asked, Whence art thou? Verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not? I have a power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee. I've written in there chapter 10, 18. Chapter 10, 18 of John says this. He mentions twice power. I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee. Jesus said in chapter 10, 18, No man taketh my life, or taketh it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus is going to correct them. Verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. He tries three means to release him. We'll get to that in a minute. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Well, whosoever make themselves a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place which is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Here they are under Roman occupation as an occupied or almost like an enslaved nation, and they say, We want a slave king. We don't want Jesus. Isn't that interesting how often in our day the world says, We want the devil as our king. We want to do our own thing, and we want the devil as our master. Oh, they may not say it in that word, but we don't want Jesus. We don't want God. What a shame. The God that loves us, the God that died for us, the God that created us, and yet we're so foolish, we choose the thing that will ruin us. Of course, it was Rome that will come in and destroy them before long. How much do you value Jesus? Pie that I believed hoped that the scourging, the abuse of Jesus would satisfy the envy of these men. Remember, for, for envy that they delivered him back in Matthew 
uh, 28 verse, or 27 verse 18. And the crowd, but, but they didn't appease them. He brought even him out. And we read in John, post-scourging. You can imagine what he looked like. Post-crowning of the thorns, that they would be appeased. But Pilate was wrong. Really, in three ways, he tried to avoid having to condemn Jesus. Let me give them to you. First of all, he sent him to Herod. <laughs> what? Galilee? Oh, that's Herod's jurisdiction. So he could get it off him. That didn't work. He ended up coming back. Uh, then, in verse 15, the Bible says, Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release to the people a prisoner whom they would, meaning of their choice. So normally they could choose any prisoner they wanted pardoned for. But this year, he didn't let them choose. Instead, he picked the worst prisoner they had, Barabbas. Surely they don't want Barabbas. Surely they'll take Jesus instead. So he only gives them a choice between Barabbas, the worst guy, or Jesus Pilate reasoned that surely the crowd would reject Barabbas and take Jesus. Who wants a convicted murderer roaming the streets, a robber that turned back into society? Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. Surely the people would take the one that healed their lame. Surely they would take the one that had healed their blind. Surely they would take the one that had cleansed their lepers and fed the multitudes and raised the dead to life and had cast out the demons out of the demon possessed. But notice verse 20, the savvy, the political savvy of these supposed religious leaders, verse 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Can I say this? The mob is often wrong. The majority is often wrong. They're working the crowd. They're convincing what to say. They're, they're telling them, choose the guilty man instead of a godly man. Now, choose one who hurt people instead of one who helped people. Choose a violent man instead of a virtuous man. Think of this evil here. Now, choose a robber instead of the redeemer. Now, choose... A godless insurrectionist instead of a God incarnate. We need a militant Messiah. Not a meek Messiah. We need someone that will teach us to fight. Not someone that will teach us to forgive. Wow. And so they cried for Barabbas. I think Pilate here was shocked at how low religion stooped. Because of envy, the Bible says. I think he had underestimated the malice, the hate in the heart of this, the priest. What an awful view. Then verse 25, Pilate turns them over and they answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Oh, what an awful thought to think. His blood the, the judgment, he, he's saying, I, I'm innocent. He tried to wash his hands. I don't want the blame of this. I don't want this on me. Unfortunately, he couldn't. It's still to this day, Pilate's the one that signed. He had the authority to release him. What he said was true. He had the authority to crucify or release, but he ended up giving in to pressure. But think of what they said on our children. What wretched thing to say. The blood of God be on our children and on us. And truly it was. I read to you not long ago what happened in AD 70 when the Roman Emperor Titus came in. History tells us. And of course, Jesus knew this and could see this, and certainly this is what would happen in, in many of their lifetime. The siege of Jerusalem was one of the most terrible in history. The Romans first systematically subdued Galilee in a series of fierce battles, at times massacring all the inhabitants of a city, especially if it had been put up a particularly stubborn defense. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, instead of preparing for the coming siege by uniting under a common leader, various factions savagely fought one another. Terrible scenes of carnage and atrocity took place. Famine stalked the stricken streets. Ruffian soldiers defending the city were merciless in their hunt for food. They seized people they suspected of concealing food, tortured them, demanding they tell the secrets they often did not have regarding the food stores. Natural affection and generous sentiment vanished before the plague of hunger. People ate awful and filth, and some even became cannibals and devoured their own children. A measure of wheat was worth its weight in gold. That's what happened in their lifetime and their children. When Titus took charge of the campaign, he added new horrors. He crucified Jewish prisoners, as many as 500 at a time. 
You read history, that's exactly what happened in AD 70, just 40 years later. The prisoners were brought in nightly. The soldiers fastened the victims to the crosses in all sorts of positions. Meanwhile, in the city, treacheries went on. The high priest Matthias was slain on the charge of holding correspondence with the Romans, but not until his three sons were massacred before his eyes. People started to desert. The Arabian and Syrian allies of the Romans seized a large party of deserters, cut them open alive looking for gold and jewels they were suspected of swallowing. When the siege was all over, the Romans had 97,000 captives on their hands. Only 97,000. The number of those who had been slain or who had died of famine is estimated 1.3 million people. His blood be upon us and our children. The tallest and strongest looking of the captives were selected to grace Titus' triumphal return to Rome. A vast number, including the old and sick, were put to death. Thousands were dispatched to the mines in various parts of the empire or distributed among the provinces for the amusement of the populace in the arenas. Because they hated the Jews so much, they renamed it Palestine in honor of the Philistines, their arch nemesis and enemy of the Jews. Thus Jerusalem fell. His blood be on us and our children. And so it has been for nearly 2,000 years. The self-pronounced curse has pursued the Jews from land to land. Yet as a nation, they're still rejecting Jesus Christ in unbelief. Verse 22 Pilate saith to them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. By the way, sooner or later, that question has to be answered by all of us. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? The old gospel hymn puts it this way, Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken, what meaneth the sudden call? What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, What will he do with me? Number two, not only the king's condemnation, but the king's crown. Verse 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The scourging by the Romans would be something that was so brutal, they would take what they called the cat of nine tails. And it was a leather, it was a leather thing. This is just something to help you think of it. This has nine ends to it. And uh, they were skilled at using it. Uh, the law was 39 of the Jewish tradition, and you can study, the Bible never says how many lashes Jesus got, all right? But uh, Paul received 39 lashes, save one, the Bible says, I think five times it was. And so they would, the reason they would not give 40 is that would be considered a death sentence, and so in case you miscounted, uh, you would always give one less. But they would begin, the, they would say as they would hit them with this, and they would be so skilled to bring blood on the first blow, it would bring blood. They would tie a man at a low point on a post so to arch the skin of his back in a way that the first blow would bring blood. At the end of each of these nine things would be a bone or a piece of lead or maybe a piece of glass, something attached to rip open the flesh. Uh, they said at the end, your back would be like ribbons as they over and over again would beat. And when they would latch in like that, they would yank back to rip the flesh. They were, they were practiced and good at it. Many died while they were being whipped as the organs would begin to be exposed and then be lashed and lacerated and the organs would be opened up like that and they would die from the beating. Many didn't live through it. And by the way, if you want to know how strong or how much of a man the Lord Jesus was, uh, he certainly was a man's man, no doubt about that. But he took all this, again, as I said earlier, for you and for me. That was my whipping. That was your beating that should have been. If you can imagine 39 with nine tails on it, that's as many as 351 lacerations or stripes. Verse 27, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. So here's a whole group, and you can imagine under these soldiers that fought together and all the time together, there was a group of them that were hardened and that uh, liked to... Uh, play like a cat, plays with the mouse, and uh, abuse even someone like this. And it didn't matter to what degree they abused him. He was already condemned to die. And by the way, what fun to have someone that claimed to be a king. This guy must be deluded. <laughs> the Jews have a king anyway. <laughs> what a preposterous thought. Romans ruling them. Romans rule them. And so they platted a crown of thorns. If you can imagine... And they put it on his head, and then they took a reed and began to beat it down upon him. 
And uh, they would go deep into the skull, maybe even uh, uh, not only just in the skin, but you know how a head wound, if you've ever had a head wound, bleeds. You can imagine the blood running down. And then, keep reading. By the way, they didn't know how appropriate this crown of thorns really was. Thorns is a picture of the curse. Jesus, because of sin, the curse became the curse for us, the Bible says. It's quite amazing to think about. Verse 30, keep reading 28, and they stripped him of, put on the scarlet robe, and they plaited a kind of thorns they put upon his head, and a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head, driving those thorns in. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him, put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. Likely, as you read history, the Romans played one of their favorite games. They called it hot hands. And they would show the prisoner all their fists. Here's my fist. They'd get a look at everybody's fist. And then they'd blindfold them. And they'd all come and punch them as hard as they could, except one. And then they'd unblindfold them and say, you guess now, as you look at our fist now, which one didn't hit you? Of course, even if he might have guessed right, they could never be right. And then they'd play it again. And they'd just beat them to a pulp, just for fun. Again, you see the heart of man. What a wicked men abusing their maker like this. I believe our Savior was so mutilated that you wouldn't even have recognized him had you known him. In fact, the Bible says as much, Isaiah 52, 14, as many were stonied at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Isaiah 56, 50, verse 6 says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. You all know you'd rather be slapped than, or punched than spit on. Such a degrading thing, such an awful Someone just come up and spit on you. Jesus took all this humiliation and pain without speaking, without fighting back. Because he was taking it for you in your place, in my place. 1 Peter 1.18 speaks of it, For as much as you know you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin. None of us could say that. If we suffer for something, we're sinners. We've done things we, should, we shouldn't have done. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Do you understand? He not only died for us, he died as us. He took our sin on him and died as an awful sinner. That's why God had to turn his back on him and forsake even his own son. His submission was not a sign of weakness here. It was a sign of strength. He was giving himself. An offering for me and you. See, the amazing thing is, if the Jews had killed him, they would have stoned him. That's their, that was their method of killing, like they stoned Stephen. But it had been prophesied by a young Jewish boy centuries earlier named David in Psalm 22 that his hands and feet would be pierced. Psalm 22, 16, For dogs had compassed me about. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. He might not even have known what death by crucifixion was. It wasn't even something that was done in that day. And yet the prophecy was there from that far ago, that time before. Number three, the king's condemnation, the king's crown. Lastly, the king's crucifixion, verse 31. The king's crucifixion. He's crucified right about the sixth hour here. And then the soldiers of the governor... Uh, I, I skipped ahead, excuse me, let me see, uh, verse 31. And after that, they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. It seems 
as if the Bible never says he fell. I know songs sometimes saying he fell beneath the load. It doesn't ever say that in the Bible. But it does seem that Jesus, after the, being up all night in this illegal trial, uh, first in prayer in the garden, then arrested, then in this illegal trial, and, and then being beaten so severely, first by the Jews, then by the Romans, being scourged, and then beaten again. And then it seems he was unable, or at least appeared to be unable, to carry his cross. He started carrying his cross, we know that, because of John nineteen seventeen, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. So he began to carry it. Maybe he was too slow. Maybe he wasn't moving as quick as, as, as they want. I don't know. It does, the Bible doesn't tell us. But evidently the Romans then didn't, wasn't happy enough with it. Or they maybe had some amount of mercy. It didn't look like he could do it. I don't know. But verse 32, they came out and found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. According to Mark 15, 21, it seems that Simon of Cyrene and his boys were saved as a result of this. Mark 15, 21 says, And they compelled one Simon a Cyrenian who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And so the way Mark refers to them there gives the idea that his readers would know these boys, Rufus and Alexander. Pretty interesting. And uh, they would recognize them. Apparently they were well-known church members now at this writing. Romans 16, 13 says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Likely they believe that's the same Rufus that's mentioned as the son of Simon Cyrene. You think about that. Jesus somehow, even in that condition, won their hearts. I don't know if he thanked them for carrying it for them. I don't know what was said as they walked that path, being marched to Golgotha to be crucified. How the conversation went, I have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. But even in that mutilated condition, the love of Christ comes through. Think of it. Oh, if we could just get a glimpse of Jesus and His great love for us. What a Savior we have. He will win some of the Roman soldiers uh, that crucify Him. We'll see that tonight before this chapter is over. Simon of Cyrene came to Jerusalem to sacrifice a Passover lamb. It was Passover. But instead he met the Passover lamb. He met the Lamb of God who was sacrificed for him. Verse 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. It was customary to give this type of a pain or narcotic drink to a, the guy being crucified for pain's sake. But Jesus refused it. He, he wanted to have his full faculties about him as he died for me and for you. In the inspired record, it's as if God placed the mantle over this darkness here now. It's quite something to think about. Psalm 69, 21 says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Verse 35, let's keep reading. And they crucified him. Part his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled as spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. Upon my vesture did they cast lots. They, the vesture was sewn all one piece, and they didn't want to tear it. Probably sewn by loving hands for the Lord Jesus. So they gambled for it. But I want you to know those, notice those four words, verse 35. And they crucified him. It's amazing to me. You read the gospel writers, none of them tell of the crucifixion. You can read other authors that might talk about how someone held his hand and then took the hammer and put the spike and blew the spike through his hand and then the other, then the feet, and how they maybe lifted him up on that pole and dropped him down in the hole that would have dislocated his joints, as the Bible talks about his bones being dislocated. But the Bible doesn't say it. I believe it's because it's beyond description what Jesus went through for us, what the Savior endured for us, what in love He paid for your salvation and for mine. In the inspired record, it's as if God said no. He placed a mantle, like I said, of darkness over it. In the last three hours of life of Jesus on the cross, this is, this is too sacred. This is something you can't look at. It's beyond human comprehension. You could not grasp it, even if I tried to explain it. As if the Lord's telling us that. The suffering cannot be fathomed. I believe when the darkness came, that 
that cross really became an altar. That Jesus was paying for the sins of the whole world. The simple statement there, that's it, verse 35, and they crucified him. The gospel records record the historical facts of the Lord's suffering and death, but the epistle writers will give the theological meaning of it. And uh, we see that as you read the rest of the New Testament of what Christ really purchased for us with his blood. But let's conclude this morning, verse 36, and sitting down, they watched him there. And sitting down, they watched him there. Can you imagine uh, if you've ever had to put down an animal? It's not something you enjoy. It's not something you want to watch. These vile, wicked creatures, me, you, men, mankind, sit down to watch. Think for a moment. Here we see humanity reach its lowest depth. Never in all the annals of history was such a terrible work done. Man's wickedness could go no further. Man has killed his maker. Nailing him to the cross. And they sit down to watch him die. I believe among that crowd was Saul of Tarsus. He would say in his own writing in 1 Timothy, he called himself the chief of sinners. I believe he said that because he was. Hardened at this point. Later he would get saved and become the Apostle Paul. But the amazing thing as you study Matthew 27 is Pilate knew what was right, but refused to do anything about it. I wonder in your life right now what you know is right. Maybe you're doing wrong right now, but you know what's right. Or a decision you're yet to make, and you know what's right. Maybe something going on at work or something in your family, and you know what's right, but will you do it? Pilate knew what was right. He knew he was innocent. But the Bible says in Mark 15, 15, willing to content or please the people. Oh, what mistakes we make when we're more interested in pleasing self or others than we are pleasing God. Willing to please or content the people. Judas yielded himself to the devil in the great sin. Satan entered into him. Peter yielded to the flesh as we saw his sin last week when he denied the Lord. But Pilate yielded to the world, the pressures of the world. And he listened to the crowd. Can I remind you again, the crowd is often wrong. The majority is often wrong. Pilate looked for the easy way, not the right way. And by the way, young people, beware of looking for the easy way. Don't be lazy. The easy way often isn't the right way. Do right even if it's hard. It's far better to do right. Even if there's peer pressure, even if everyone else is doing the wrong thing, you do right. That's good preaching for all of us. In the end, Pilate went down in history as the man who condemned Jesus. The king's blood shed for you and for me. Will you bow in prayer for, with me?